We're all getting started, folks. Sorry about that. Hello, and welcome to the fourth annual Pipeline Conference. I'm Tram Lee Jones, TPC's 2022 chair. TPC began with Fran Zendonella Benjamin and Alexis Cassis, who had the vision to inspire and share pipeline knowledge widely, both within our industry and, more importantly, from other industries. Workflows and pipelines are increasingly converging, and it's an exciting time for us to gather and discuss trends. While this may be our fourth year, I'll be honest when I say I'm not really sure that we hit uh, the rhythm that we thought we'd have by now. So our first year uh, of this conference was in 2019 in LA, yes, in person, um, where we sold out. We were so excited for the following year in Washington. We had secured a location. We started making plans. Then boom, 2020 and the pandemic. So we pivoted to virtual where we partnered with DigiPro and have been collaborating with them since. Personally, it's been so rewarding to connect and work with some really top-notch industry professionals. When we started planning earlier this year, we were conflicted about whether or not to host this in person or virtual. And let me tell you, there were moments where we had FOMO for deciding to make it virtual. We didn't want to miss out on the in-person connections, so we held our Pipeline Awards at the end of DigiPro. We hope you were able to attend, but if not, the recording uh, will be uploaded to Hua very shortly, or if not already. For those of you, um, oh, for those of you who've attended before, you know we've, we always mention how it takes a village to put this together. So thank you to everyone for attending another year of virtual events and to continue to support this platform. Big thanks to ACM for supporting our partnership with DigiPro and to DigiPro who have been so gracious with their time and energy collaborating with us. Thank you to our platinum sponsors, AMD, Animal Logic, Autodesk, AWS, our gold sponsors, Conductor, Foundry, F-Track, Pixar, Side Effects, Walt Disney Animation Studios, and community sponsor AWS, ASWF. Uh, we wouldn't be here without you. Thank you to our speakers, our moderators, and panelists. You are the heart and soul of this conference, and we are so grateful for your participation in our sessions this year. And of course, to all our committee volunteers, like past years, every year has been different. So thank you so, so much for your dedication to this and to our families for the extra work it took to bring this all together. We have a packed schedule today with nine sessions, including this one, and a social gathering platform, Gather Town, for a space to connect and chat with others. Don't forget to make use of the Whova platform and connect with others attending virtually and to plan out your day. So let me kick this off now with our keynote. He is a pioneer in our industry, having been a co-founder of PDI from 1981 to 2008. He led the studio's proprietary animation system, which resulted uh, in a SciTech Motion Picture Academy SciTech Award in 1998. He won another SciTech Award in 2016 for his contributions to DreamWorks' design of their media review system. Without further ado, I am incredibly honored and humbled to introduce to you Richard Truong. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, we just had our 42nd reunion for PDI just last week. So it's very nostalgic week, week for me, particularly now I have to go through and talk about pipelines. And hopefully this will be not too crazy. I'm going to rattle through my whole career and talk about all my good and bads in dealing with the whole issues of how to build a pipeline from scratch. So let me start sharing my screen. The, f the funny thing is when we had our reunion, after the reunion, the group that with a pipeline engineer posted a picture on YouTube, on a Facebook. The first comment was, how can anything get done? You guys all standing there. So that's how valuable people are who works on pipeline. So here we go, let's see. Okay, good. So I'm gonna go journey through sort of my personal experience of where I encountered these challenges and how we started from nothing to end up to going through all the experience I've gone through in my career in building various pipelines. So it's not just one thing, but many things as you will see. So first, just dive a little history. I came from Hong Kong originally. I, uh, during the protests in Hong Kong, not the recent one, but one way back in 1967, I immigrated with my brother to Sacramento in, in 1968. So, but my background is actually in art. I'm not a geeky programmer 
in the beginning because I really wanted to be a painter. So these are my some of my artwork, including a painting of a mural in a bank in New York City. So my background is actually in creating art. That's my real passion to make picture. So in terms of my hobby was computer. In 1974, I had my first experience broke in, I broke into a room in a school to learn how to use the PDP-8. And then in, during college, I learned a various series of computing devices, including building my first computer in 1976. So I'm an artist that found computer as a hobby. So, and originally I wanted to be a medical illustrator. So, but turns out I wasn't good enough to get into grad school. So I ended up getting a job in engineering, but somehow I landed my first job at HP's RF and microwave lab. So what has that do with computer graphing? Absolutely nothing. But what I learned there, this is the place where Bill and Dave Packard started uh, HP. I learned a lot about engineering. And to me, that, that experience taught me how to be disciplined and be thorough in covering my ground. Because we had a design instrument that fits into a nuclear submarine, you know, and survive, you know, popping up in the Arctic and Antarctica or something like that. So, but during those times, I was very fortunate to be able to catch a really uh, unique experience because HP engineer have access to video stream, not stream, okay, stream, but not the right word back then, it's microwave of uh, classes from Berkeley. And that during 1980, that was the summer that, you know, Ed Catmull, Jim Blinn, Lauren Carpenter, and Albert Ray Smith and a few others taught a course on computer graphics. I had zero experience in computer graphics. I'm just an artist. And when I took this class, it just, my mind just blown wide open back then. So after that, through that process, I actually met my first partner, Carl Rosendahl, who was starting, he started PDI by himself in 1980. In 1981, I joined him to help him set up his PDP 1144 to hook up to a frame buffer because I wrote the driver for it. And then in exchange to free time on his Foucault frame buffer. Because back then, nobody ever heard of a Foucault frame buffer, you know, in real life. So you only read about it. So he had one. So I basically exchanged my time to help write software. That's how I got involved with PDI back in the over Christmas of 1981. Then 1982, we all got started and Glenn joined us as three of us back then. We said, we want to make picture of computer, right? Back then we had a PP11, which only had a 64K ad address space. Well, reality only 32K, but I won't get into the detail. And the 20 megabyte drive. Okay, that's unfathomable in today's terminology. But we had a frame buffer. We have a full color frame buffer and VT100 terminal, a tablet, and, and a park. No, no mouse back then. And we decided to make a business out of it. It was a startup, three of us. And we got together and we wrote software. And first thing we wrote was a render. I wrote a renderer to make picture. And 82, in fact, I show at Catmull my first picture at Boston SIGGRAPH. And uh, that was a memorable moment. I won't get into that either. So 1983, we decided to show off our idea of what a pipeline needs to be. So we actually, me and Glenn wrote a paper to get a trip to go to Japan in the Tokyo Intergraph to display on, to show the world what we think computer graphics pipeline is supposed to be. And to be honest, we had no idea what we were doing. You know, we 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 wrote all together. We wrote a parser for a scripting language that generates geometries, generates screen space polygon. I wrote the render that rendered these images uh, all on the PEP eleven forty four. Don't forget, this only have thirty three k address space, so which means you can't address a full image, right? Because the full, full five twelve by five twelve image, quarter million pixels. And 24 bits, so that's way beyond. So you had to do a scanline renderer. So I wrote the scanline renderer, and back then computer were very slow. So the renderer was completely written in integer. So all the math, and even though the shading looked really smooth, because my background is in signal processing, so I knew how to write the equation so it comes out nicely. 
uh, even an integer. So our renderer that was written that end of 82, beginning of 83, uh, the internal was all done in engine. The shader and everything was done in engine. In fact, it's probably the longest piece of software in use. DreamWorks didn't stop using it till 2012, which makes it almost, well, it's, it's a long time. So, but I won't get into that either. So 1984, we started to do work. Uh, we got a deal with a Brazilian company. So we had to build a pipeline to do, uh, back then the only thing you can really practically do on the computer is television graphics. So we built a pipeline to do that with a VAC 750 and the deal we made. And we had a vector display called an IMI, which was very expensive, it was very difficult to use, even though Don Benhaus, well, oh, by the way, that's a picture of the original group that built all the tools in the beginning. And we had a raster frame buffer. So we had to figure out how to optimize this workflow so we can actually produce content and make money. And back then you had to record things on one inch tape. And the first few jobs we did, we manually do rewind, play forward and insert one frame at a time manually by hand onto the one inch tape. And there, back then there was a Lion Lamb controller that cost $17,000 to do that, but we couldn't afford it. So I bought a hundred dollar microprofessor and hand assembled some code, decompile the code coming between the deck and the computer, and then wrote our own controller. So you had to be very resourceful. So this was our first real pipeline that lasted almost uh, guy 84. About six, five, six years, we would do nothing but use this pipeline to create uh, animated logos. It was the central part of our business. Didn't have that many tools to it, but it was the fundamental part is really a scripting language that generated these bike, not byte code, but virtual machine instruction set that can be modified in real time using our animation tool. Then they can decompile back into the script. Uh, there was a renderer behind that. And uh, I wrote our first compositor also in 1983. And then uh, in 84, I wrote our first lighting tool called LED. And so we had some of the earliest interactive tool for a lot of these work. You know, I always joke that Matt came out before Photoshop but it was really our compositing tool. In fact, we used that to even our first few film, uh, you know, supported by our R&D team at that point. But those are all the fundamental tools we used for many years in a very simple pipeline. We saw it came from the uh, Unix world. So we wanted everything to be very simple and easy. So everything can be scripted in, uh, you know, either born shell or, or or, or Z show, whatever back, back then. And then we made it very easy to compart, uh, put everything together in small pieces so we can compartmentalize them and let people work on it together. And then at some point we expanded in 85, expanded, we got you know third, up to 10 computer. Oh, that's a big shot. We switched from the VAX. We started with a PDP and went to a VAX, and we at that point got hold of our neighbor, like in the same business park, it was the Ridge computer. They have a 32 bit RISC computer. We adopted that to our pipeline, and there were like about 10 computers there. So we had our first render phone. And back then, we had a 10 megabit network, and it had about 10 computers with these raster tech frame buffer. And again, we still were outputting to tape initially, then to disk recorder, the Abacus disk recorder, then to D1 tape. But one of the key things we learned during that time is we were doing very high volume of work. We we're doing work for broadcast television, right? We do these packages for ABC for all the affiliates. So we had about 50 jobs a year that year. And one of these jobs, like an ABC network package, would be delivering to 200 stations. So you, as a small team of people, we had to really automate all that. So we really, really put a lot of effort into automating our pipeline so we can scale. In fact, we got to a point, our limitation was how much we can automate putting things onto tape every night because the system was all automated. And people would just go home and the system is assisted all night, crank out animation, cutting it onto tape automatically till the tape fills up. So the one hour tape fills up, that's all we can do because we can't, you know, there's no automatic way of replacing the tape on the tape deck. So we had the system really down. That's one thing we learned very early on is learn to be disciplined and build a very automated pipeline. 
Okay. And the one thing I've always been a, a, a the dream of since I started was to be able to do a pipeline that one person can do everything. I actually tried that once. When I designed the Monday Night Football opening back in 1986, I did the storyboard and I delivered it and everything in between. And that was really to help test the idea of can you build a process that one creative person can take beginning to end? And that taught me a lot in that exercise. And that was back in 1986, where you take, in fact, to be honest, it was tough, really tough to do that. And I learned a lot of what didn't work, of trying to automate a system where one person can take it from idea to, to delivery. And that's, that's when I start thinking, okay, how can we change this world we're in to make life easy so everybody can you know, not have to work long hours. And I really try not to work long hours. I think in this project, it's the only project I ever worked overnight in my whole history of working in computer graphics. So, okay, but here's something important happened in 1986. In 1986, uh, Nilo Rodas, art director from Lucasfilm, came to me and said, hey, I want to make an all CG animated film. This is 1986. And I said, why don't you go talk to those computer graphics people at, at uh, Lucas? He goes, no, 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 those guys don't understand filmmaking. You guys understand the terminology. I want to work with you guys. So Nilos and us came together and had this project called TSP, we call it the secret project. And we actually made a test and Nilos and us and me and Nilos and that buyer showed up at George Lucas office at the ranch. And we pitched to him the idea of making an all CG film, okay? And this is 1986, end of 86. And George basically just laughed us out of his office. Apparently he had such a bad time with computer graphics up to that point that he felt like we didn't, that nobody wants to see a computer animated film. So, but again, that stopped my mind thinking, right? You know, having, having George gave us the bad news that nobody wants CG film. It's that gave, let me think about how this can really be done. So in 1987, I actually wrote a proposal of how to build a fully animated project. And uh, that's a lot of trivia there, but just history. This is actually the front top page of that paper I wrote. It was an internal paper, but at then I drafted out the plan of how I think we need to do a whole pipeline of do a C CG film. But we had no idea how, other than just our dream at that point. Okay, so and then, now we start getting into, to build that, you had to build all the pieces. You can't do it overnight. A lot of this stuff never been done before, right? For example, like never been a facial animation system before. So in 1988, I wrote our first facial animation system and it's called Lips. It's, it's sort of a dumb name, but that's what it was back then. It basically had a, a traditional animator animate the lips on the character, okay? And I still never forget, the first time we tested this, we put an animation looping on a, on a computer screen. People would walk by and just stare at it for like literally half an hour because they never seen anything like that before. That is so fluid. And so we now start to realize we can now start building pieces of it. Right, it, we didn't, it was a very small company. We you couldn't have done all this overnight. So we now I'll set our mindset to, okay, let's tackle these things piece by piece, right? We started forming a character animation group, did a lot of personal project. And that was one of the big plus of our philosophy is we always put a lot of our, make sure our effort, our revenue is spent on personal project as well as R&D for the future. So it's not just you know paying the bills. So you sometimes it got a little tricky, but we still kept that promise. So in 1988, that's when things start going a little crazy, right? A lot of new ideas that come into play. Now a group uh, with that by Jamie Dixon and Graham Walter start working with um, Jim Henson about the idea of doing real time puppeteering, right? So this is another thing that came out of nowhere that now made the pipeline a little bit more convoluted, right? Suddenly now you go from the CG pipeline, now you have real time input from capturing motion, right? Back then you didn't have optical systems. So we were using mechanical system, but it was working. Jim Henson actually did a real time puppeteer 
using the system and worked very closely with him back then. And uh, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a long story, but I won't get into detail. But there's surprises around every corner in, in this type of industry. Whenever you think you know everything, you're wrong. So you're always wrong when you think that. I can tell you that. I mean, just speaking from experience. So this is 1988. So 1989, I say, okay, let's rethink how we animate. Because back then, computer graphics still such a hurdle for most people. So I decided to build a animation system as a test where it does no numbers, no curve, no nothing. It's just a dope sheet for animator. And then uh, we just hired a bunch of animators from CalArt. And I said, okay, here's an animation system where you just drag and drag the character around and set keyframe. And it was a, we did actually did a full job of it. I published a paper at Sigra. I, well, I tried to publish a paper at Sigra, but they rejected it for a reason I won't get into. But it was um, a real learning experience for us that given the technology back then, as much as I can sell, solve a multi manifold problem in real time using recursive descent and complicated math. In fact, this didn't use any trigonometry for doing animation, which drove a lot of people crazy. But it didn't quite fit the mindset of most of the people at that time. People wanted curve, people wanted other things to animate. So this was sort of a very good ex exercise, but it was in the wrong place at the wrong time, okay? So 1989, we got our first SGI. Uh, as you, you guys take hardware, you know, graphics for granted. Back then that was like unheard of. So when SGI came out, the first computer, we we're obviously one of the first to jump on it. I got a 4D25. And, but one thing you realize immediately is there's no UI toolkit to do what you need to do. And since I wrote the motion tool and I wrote the uh, lighting tool we had at that point, I really had to port it over. So, you know, I, I had to like work long hours and I wrote a UI toolkit using OpenGL, which is a little crazy. But I wrote a UI toolkit and I ported all my tools over to it. So at that point in 89, we had all our tools running on the SGI now with our custom UI toolkit uh, so we can do production. On it. And so again, you run into these hurdles, right? You, you, once in a while you go, hey, you know, I'm settled, everything going smoothly. But then next thing you know, there's a better piece of hardware come out and you throw everything out the door and you just start from scratch again. And that, that's costly. I mean, for a small company, that's very costly. And for a big company, it's actually even costlier because you have so many people trained on the previous system and you have to re-educate, you have to redo your pipeline and you have film in production. So you guys know, that's a very tricky problem, right? And, and large scale production. So, okay, going. So 1989, the year even got more crazy because we actually landed our first VFX film. Um, uh, PD, I, I wasn't involved in this directly, but we had our first visual effects film called film called Solar Crisis. Uh, but this has a lesson in being lucky or not. In this case, we were not. The film was so poorly done, it got the Alan Smithy director uh, credit, as you all know what that means. And then we, but the good thing is we learned to set up remote production. We had a team in LA, we had a remote production. We ended up setting up LA office. We had a uh, network connection. We have live video link 24-7 between the two studio over basically an uh, old-fashioned phone line. And, and uh, we, because back then the line wasn't that expensive. But that, that year also did our first 3D project. We did Muppet Vision because our work with Jim Henson. We did Muppet Vision 3D for Disney on Orlando. And again, that was a whole deal learning around because if you thought your pipeline can handle everything. The next thing you know, somebody come in and say, hey, let's do a 3D project. You say, how the hell are we going to do that? We have no idea. And that's where that was what was exciting about being there through all these years is I love the moment when my when the whole team go, we have no idea how to do this. And that's when you really go, yeah, that's it. We Now we got something fun. So we did our first 3D pipeline back then, you know, among all the other things I mentioned during 89. And then 1990, because back then film was all, still a lot of optical compositing. And we actually ended up building our uh, higher less dinner. He came from uh, IOM. And we built our own digital film scanner in 1990 and started doing uh, film, all right? Our own film compos digital compositing. I still remember spending days in and day out sitting in the theater trying to 
convince director photographer and directors, director photography and director that we can actually do digital film. Because people were not convinced back then digital film make sense at all. Quality wasn't there. So we had to prove that to convince people. Okay, so 1989 wasn't over at that point, right? And still going. That's one of the, definitely one of the craziest years. We also came with this concept of doing morph. And that gave us probably more profit than we can ever imagine in doing work in that space in the commercial world, right? We first did a Voyager commercial in 89. And from that point on, we did tons of Michael Jackson project and a lot of morph project. But again, out of nowhere came this new concept of doing work in a totally different way. So somehow that tends to have integrate into our workflow. So in, in, in literally months, within months, we had to, a few months, we had to take this new concept, build into a tool that animator can use, connect it to a pipeline and get, to, get it to deliver content, right? And I think th th that year we did probably close to a hundred project that year. And you just can't imagine like, how do you manage a hundred project in a small studio? But, you know, somehow we pulled it out. So 1990, we got our first chance to test my whole idea of doing a long format project. Uh, we got the bit, of, we outbid ILM to get this uh, primetime TV special called The Last Halloween. It's first time CG character combined with live action character in a TV, primetime TV special. Uh, it was, you know, it was funded by the m and candy people, but we had a chance to do this. And because we landed this project, I just rolled up my sleeve, sat down, wrote our first pipeline. I mean, literally by myself, I sat there and wrote it. I wrote in the file check-in system, file checkout, all the file management, and just basically all the ideas I had up to this point has always been sitting in my head. They didn't really have a justification for doing it. So this project came along. I said, okay, time to execute. So I sat down basically in two weeks, wrote the whole, the, all the file management system pipeline. And it, it, I tell you, that really saved our ass on this project because some, about like a few weeks into the project, one day I, I was out of the office. I got a call, so you got to come back in. All the files are disappearing. It's one of the new P, P, PA we hire. Didn't know you have mounted file system. She thought, oh, all these files in my computer, they must be junk. She started deleting the whole production tree. But luckily I had hey, a, a pipeline with file management. I got back, we had, we're back up in business within half an hour. So there you go, proof of concept. Um, but the other big thing I did on here was I wrote our first editorial pipeline for animator. One of the real believer that transparency for every person working on a project is essential. And back in 1990, you didn't have video encoders and things like that. So I had to write my own video encoder. So I wrote a video encoding, it wasn't high quality, but every animator now can see not only their shot in the motion tool, but they see it in context of the whole film, whole show. You can scroll around, look at any shot, play through it, see how it cuts into your shot, how it goes out of it. If it's render, it'll be render image. If it's wireframe, it's wireframe. So I built our first sort of editorial pipe, desktop editorial pipeline on this project. Then thereafter, many years, we did a lot of character work using this, like the 3D, I mean, the Homer Simpsons uh, TV special. We did the, you know, Pillsbury Doughboy. I did the first anime character in the commercial for Coke. So a lot of fun, really fun stuff. But again, leveraging our desire to take, tell story and make picture. Oh, so. Things settle down for a while, but then things start to change again because we've been doing film effects for a while. And then in 1984, I've been you know, supervising a bunch of projects and then we got this chance to do a test to do a digital Batman. Every studio in the industry had a chance to do a test on it, but we landed the project. And so we get to first do the first optical motion capture digital stuntman, right? So we got a bunch of data sitting in 3D space and then what we have to do is now create a pipeline using this. Like, you know, you just get a bunch of points, right? From the motion capture comp 
Okay. They weren't capturing motion, they were capturing 3D point. So performers wearing, you know, dots on them and they capture all these dots in the space. So we got a lot of 3D data. So I sat down and wrote a mocap pipeline. So converting the 3D points into our character. Dick Walsh started to work on the body for the character. And we pulled this off. We did our first digital stunt film uh, using Batman. And um, we learned a lot. I mean, again, you'd never expect that suddenly now there's a new way of doing motion, right? We did the mechanical capture that helped us a lot, give us a head start. But the optical created a whole different set of problems in terms of how you edit it. And we also had added cloth simulation. Batman Cape was completely computer cloth simulator. But that's one thing we learned very quickly there is physical simulation has a lot of constraint. For example, you can't direct it. I still remember showing the Schumacher director a first shot of Batman sliding down on his cape, flopping in the air. And Joe said, this looks great, except on frame 270, I want the cape to do a you know whip around the corner. And I looked at the team and everybody who did the work, you know, we sat down and talked about it and say, it's all in the physical simulation. There's no way we control that. We try animating with like, what we call animated by blow hair dryer. We put all these forces trying to blow it, but the animates a hand animated most of it. So, okay. So continue on 96, I got to do a lot more of this. So we did a lot more digital stunt doubles and then we did a lot more dynamic simulation. So we now have digital human completely integrated into a live action shot, some model shot as well. So these were some of the earliest digital human shots. And we know back then we weren't capable of doing the face yet. Luckily, Batman has a you know mask over his face, so we didn't have to worry about that. But again, you still have to know which direction you need to go. And there's a lot of work. That's the year that Dick Walsh started working on his uh, muscular-based facial animation system. They eventually got a Technical Academy Award on. It was driven by these projects. So again, we did a lot of commercials over the years after that. And personally, I actually had a chance to work on a lot of live action film and as a visual effects supervisor for PEI. And then what I learned from uh, working on live action project really gave me a whole new perspective on what a pipeline really needs to be. For most of you who worked in traditional CG pipeline, if you haven't had a chance to work in live action film, I definitely recommend it because it's really amazing. You work in the set, there's all these big name stars, which is just distraction most of the time, but the crew is amazing, right? Nothing beats a top-notch Hollywood crew. You have a team of people with amazing skills, but they don't have check-in, check-out system. They don't have no, you know, version control or anything like that. They just all know the job very well. A good crew can go through shooting a complex day of production while missing a beat with minimal communication. Everybody know, buddy know exactly what they have to do and when they have to do it. It's just an amazing thing to watch. And that's when I learned and realized, say, how can we make computer graphics that simple, right? How can we drive computer graphics to the simplicity of live action? And that's, again, triggered by being on the front line, learning this firsthand. So during that time, we started to got the deal with DreamWorks. We were late in getting into the CG film behind Pixar. Uh, There's another story altogether, but we could have beat Pete Pixar because we actually were in talk with Jim Henson to do a CG film uh, many years earlier. Unfortunately, Jim passed away, so that didn't happen, but that's history. So we did our first Ants film. Ants film was a pretty, you know, big challenge. I still remember the whole team coming up to me in the office one day and said, Richard, we're stuck. We have no idea what we're doing, right? And that hits you once in a while because these projects are so complicated because nobody ever done it before, right? Pixar just finishing theirs, but we were, you know, just right behind them. And the film had 1,280 shots, you know, over 100,000 frames. How do you deal with that? We never dealt with that before. So, but, and back then we were very hampered because we had a very low, low budget compared to like other studio. So we had a 10 megabit network. Imagine doing a film on a 10 megabit network. You, you, you complain even if you have 10 megabit network at home, right? Most of you have better than that. 
And that whole film took only 1.5 terabyte of data for the whole film. A part of it, because we were very smart in terms of, we knew that we had to work around our limitations. Well, from very early on, the PDF file format supported all kinds of file formats. One of the key things we put in is support for 10-bit JPEG. So most of our images actually were stored 10 pit JPEG that maintain the quality of high dynamic range without using up a lot of the space. So we did the whole film with only 1.5 terabyte of data storage. And you guys are sitting there probably laughing your head off right now, 1.5 terabyte. Most of you might have that much on your phone, right? And so we did that, but, but the key thing that made this work on this one is I wasn't really involved in the film directly because I was doing all the other uh, visual effects work at the time. But I saw one bottleneck that had to be solved because we had a 10 megabit network. Our software just didn't scale up. So I wrote a system called BFC. It's a read cache library. That, since we wrote our own software, it was like you know one hour to insert into an all two set. So we wrote, put a read cache on all our two. That allowed us to do a whole film on the 10 megabit network. And it, it was tricky because that's on that film we brought in Nick Foster, who was you know the one the pioneer on fluid simulation. We added fluid simulation to our system, which added a lot more overhead. But we got done with a very minimal setup, and and great tribute to the team that worked on it because we took what we had and made it work, and probably one of the lowest production costs of any CG film, I think. Okay, in 2000, I had a rare, rare opportunity to learn about game pipeline. A friend of mine, well, this is a long story, but Sony was just, you know, being on a, on a sort of exponential path of game PlayStation. So we were asked to do a demo, a SIGGRAPH with a prototype they call the GSQ. So we had to take one of the ants fight sequence and run it in real time on this game machine. I mean, to, in today's world with Unreal or Unity or whatever, it would be trivial to do today. But don't forget this is 2000, 22 years ago. So I put a small team together. I knew nothing about gaming, but luckily my friends were, you know, all a bunch of Sony friends of mine got together and I sat and learned and we got the ants fight sequence onto this prototype demo. And I can tell you from that experience, what I learned is that gaming and content production, the way I'm used to, lives in a totally different universe. The way we think, the way we talk, the way we handle graphics was so different. And I think, you know, as we've seen recently, the collusion between game and graphics into the metaverse, I can tell you a lot of those problems still exist. And obviously, people have gotten a lot smarter and tools have gotten a lot better. But there's a lot of issues that I think people still need to address. So then we went on and did Shrek. And you know, I won't get into all the detail now. And there's been many talks about this. It's a much bigger project, but substantially not that much bigger. We're a lot more computer. But you think about it, though. I just did the math on this one. I have more computing power at home than we did during that. And I don't have that many computers. And it's a small, you know, consumer computer, but we had GPU and all that. And 6.5 terabyte, man. I buy that on a drive at 100 bucks at, you know, on new eggs, right? So it it was, seems primitive now, but then it was pushing the state of art, right? We actually moved up to 100 megabit network, right, to the desktop. And it was a very challenging problem even back then. We pushed so many new things there. The problem I want to point out, though, because we accumulated so many years of building these things, we had 4 million lines of C code. The system was so complex, right? And that, to me, is a red flag when the system is way too complex, which is a problem now with a lot of the system people are using, right? Meyer, Blender, and all these software out there they're not recent. They're very dated in terms of where the roots came from, some of the problem we have. And you're carrying all that baggage with you. And that really hampers real efficiency in my mind. I mean, it's from my experience. 
but I won't get into that now. So 20, 2002, we closed our service business and I said, okay, what am I going to do now? And have, you know, accumulate all these vision of what I want to do. Then luckily, you know, while during those time, watching DreamWorks do all these other film. So I'm sort of saying, okay, okay, that's a given now, doing animated film. But that didn't really excite me because it was already sort of new what we're going to be facing. So there were no surprises there in terms of building the next pipeline, right? There's a lot of incremental work, better tools, improvement. But for me, I want to see things really change. So what I did in 2003 is I was very involved with SIGRA. So I saw that a lot of work in advances uh, throughout the world. So I convinced Jeffrey Kassenberg at that point, say, let's look around the world and see what we can do to work with talents from all over the you know, globe. Because I, with the internet ongoing and through SIGGRAPH, I got to see a lot of young people, probably some of you listening today, doing amazing work, right? So I say, okay, let's look, go and look. So I, so 2003, basically I got to travel the world, visit over 30 studio worldwide and see their pipeline. But obviously those are all proprietary stuff, so I can't talk about it. But it was a real learning experience for me to see where things were. So in 2004 and 2005, we actually were doing a TV show. Uh, we did a TV show, Father of Pride, Dream DreamWorks first television production. Turns out they had no idea how to do this. So I had to set up the pipeline overseas at the studio called Imaji in Hong Kong, even though they were not our first choice. And actually the first choice, my first choice was McGuff in Paris, but I can get, I won't get into why that didn't happen. So, but we ended up with uh, McGuff's, the studio that became Illumination, by the way. So, and so we end up using Imaji in Hong Kong because the timing worked out when they had the resource available. So, so now I get to test another one of my dream is to set up a, a global pipeline where people can work remotely on project. Obviously, this is not working in from home yet. But again, it's still dealing with the issue of how do you deal with teams of people scattered throughout in multiple places doing this. But what I learned from 2003, while I was testing all this studio worldwide, I was doing all these tests with studio in 24 hour time zone. So I understand some of the issue there. So we built this, when we set foot to do this, one of the first criteria I said to Jeffrey is, we're going to do this. We're not going to impose our way onto them because I know that will work. What we want to do is understand how they work and help them become better. That's always been my philosophy because there's a lot of cultural difference. There's a lot of historical difference. And we need to respect people and give people the room to, to grow and, and appreciate what they're doing. So we set up a pipeline and we built this complex remote production to do TV show. A TV show, you have to deliver things every week. In fact, I, the, I did contribute some software to this myself. And I actually wrote the tail end of this pipeline to allow the editorial to re-edit the show up to half an hour before we deliver to NBC. And it automated the whole assembly process and put it onto this and record it into digital tape for delivery so that we can push everything to the last moment. And which was pretty crazy if you think about it. But we had to accommodate that because we had we were taking so much feature film mentality into a TV show, which was way too heavy for a TV show. In fact, that was the year I built our first web base. This was when you know early 2000 web started taking off. So I actually built a web-based management system to see, keep track of all the work. You can see all the episodes and they click one, you get all the se sequence from that episode and you can click, you can see all the movies from that sequence, all the shots. So I did that for the show and actually soon after that, I actually did it for the whole studio. So every animator, you guys probably take all this for granted today, but this one, 2000, 2004, you can sit on anybody's desk and at DreamWorks, we had like six feature film in production. You can click on and see the status of every film in production, click on any film and see all the sequences and click on any sequence, see all the shots and they'll go back and forth in time and see the previous version, current version and see the notes and all that. 
And that was all done in 2004 because I really liked what the web brought to the table. I mean, very primitive back then. You guys look at this, probably laugh right now. But the idea was take advantage of that. The other thing I did too back in 2006 was built a tool at the other end of the spectrum. Because I was sort of executive at the studio, so I have access to pretty much everything. And the one thing we realized, we didn't manage our resource and budget that well. So I actually built a top end tool to do manage people and resource across the whole studio. And I can give a whole lecture on this one, so I won't get into detail now. The time's running short. I have so much more to say. Then I next thing I did was help DreamWorks set up the Indian, uh, in, the, uh, the Indian animator team in Bangalore for a DreamWorks remote production studio they had. Uh, working with Publicus Interactive, it's a studio in uh, Bangalore. Okay, so 2008, I left. Okay, you figure, okay, this is in, I've done enough. Because my last job after I built that scheduling thing for the whole studio was to do 10 year planning and look at the schedule. Oh, by the way, that plan, that scheduling was written in OpenGL, which is crazy. But then I watched all the film for the next 10 years, I say, boy, this is all looks the same to me. Time to go do something else. So I did a startup called CloudPick, which was like, again, this bad timing. 2008, come out and say, hey, I want to build a P2P collaboration platform so people can work together, serverless. Like that was like one of the worst here to do that because everybody else is jumping on the centralized cloud model at that point, right? The, everybody on AWS, everyone, Microsoft were building the cloud service and nobody cared about peer-to-peer. -peer. So there was a startup. We, also what was tricky to do this, to be honest, is back then it's really hard to find software engineer to understand what peer-to-peer -peer really means and be able to do network programming, asynchronous stuff. And it was really hard. And before I closed it in 2007, I actually got a system running but it was just uphill battle because the rest of the world had gone through centralized cloud storage. But again, that's another talk all together. In 2011, 14, I went to, in help to fund my company, I took a part-time job running a, turning around a studio in Taiwan. It's called Next Media Animation. They're the one who did the animated news. Well, the reason I took this job is when I met the owner, he was telling me about what they do. They have a three, because they're, uh, news company, they have a three hour turnaround on production from the point a news story broke to the point where they have fully rendered high def CG with mix of sound mixed in for delivery, three hours, okay? I was talking about talking to people at Hollywood about that. They say, we can't even have a meeting in three hours, right? We were delivering content, this place was delivering content in three hours. The system was pretty primitive back then, and they wanted somebody to come in, so shape up the studio and so pivot it. So I came in and said, look, this is a dream come true. You guys are doing something I always dreamt about doing, so I came in. So I helped them set up a, uh, a mobile content, right? This gave me a chance to also get into the mobile space. So I set up a mobile content pipeline for a studio, in a creative studio in Japan, and we were taking anime from famous uh, anime designer and turn in the content on a daily basis. So this is not just the three hour news, but we're adding pipeline to do actually animated content on a daily basis. Okay, another crazy thing. So, and then I put a team together, led it by a guy that used to work for me, one of the most brilliant person I ever worked with, Alberto Malache. And he came out and helped me put a team together and we built a pipeline for real time content, right? And this is really real-time content where we, where we actually doing the creative work and doing the delivery all at the same time, right? I'll get into that on the next slide, but we use Maya because everybody's familiar with Maya. So anime was sitting in front of a computer, but using Maya, but we connect the Unreal Engine to it. So you have a virtual camera using Unreal. You can look into the set. It's like live action, right? Going back to what I said about live action. You know, every person working on a project now has presence in this virtual stage. So the lighter can go light the room, the model can set dress the room, while the, while the motion people are mocap, they can practice in the room. And we've delivered this way. And it was, it was proved, we proved the concept was totally doable back in 2012, which is 10 years ago. 
we actually did a live show. Uh, the upper left there is an image from the show in real time, rendered in Unreal. And the performer were in mocap suit, but it was a very low cost system. One of the criteria I gave the team, I said, look, we want to do this, but I want to do it at the lowest possible budget. Mocap was done with three uh, deaf camera, you know, that you buy from uh, the Microsoft, you know, Xbox. And then the, uh, we buy a cheap webcam connected to the face of the animator so you can capture the facial expression, right? And the whole system was done with off the shelf consumer hardware, right? We didn't want to go and spend unlimited number because I'm so used to Hollywood just blowing number left and right. So I really want to do this for very low cost. So we built this system. We actually did a show live from Taiwan to Japan. And you can see the writer on the lower right, they were monitoring the hashtag feedback from the viewer and actually updating the script in real time. So literally this was a real time production where we closed the loop between the content creator, the consumer and the production all were happening in real time simultaneously back in 2012. Okay. So the other thing I did too that next year is I got into AR. So because they were a news company, they have magazine, they have newspaper. So we built AR pipeline for delivering content. So people can get a newspaper, point their phone at it, see a story come to life. That was fun. And then you learn very quickly, there's a lot of limitation to these technology, what's good, what's bad. And uh, I'll, I'll get more into that in the next few slides. Then in 2013, also what I did too is got up, got their production pipeline up and running for uh, daily delivery of mobile content, right? And turns out the challenge Jeb, was technically there was a lot of issue, but the biggest hurdle was the creative process, right? Imagine going to your creative team and say, okay, yeah, they got this story out by tomorrow, you know, but luckily, a lot of these people came from the news story side. They can turn things on very quickly. So I got to work with various studios, including one in, called One Animation in, in uh, Singapore. And, and I will play some of these content. I'll jump to it. So these were content that were done, that were delivered every day. Really high quality work. But the biggest change we had to make was in the creative process. So I was the creative producer on this project. Instead of working on the technical side, because the, there's plenty of people already on that. I help them work out the creative workflow so we can get daily delivery and process, how to make quick decisions, how to cut corners, how to tell stories and make sure they're successful in a very short amount of time. So we, we did that. And then oh, just, just a quick go back. Oh, let me, I'll skip this one. So this is actually the live show we did that were uh, delivered in real time using the uh, Unreal Pipeline back in 2012, 13 timeframe. And no cab had done very low cost. I mean, I told the team, I said, look, we wanted to make this affordable, right? And scalable. So it's, an, an, it's a long story, but unfortunately the people, the guy who owned this company for political reason, well, he's sitting in jail right now. So a lot of this stuff didn't end up going anywhere. And, uh, but again, so, okay, then after that, I thought that, and I was winding down my cloud pick business. I just, I got called in to design a AR project for a museum. And they have licensed the Cars character from one of my old time biggest competitor, Pixar, and to do an AR project for a museum. And back at then, at first I go, well, AR, that can be that bad bag as it did in Taiwan. And so I had some experience with it. So we're going to do it and then to do it had to be delivered on the iPad rather than the phone so that kids can use it in a museum and using all the cars character. And that was a bigger challenge than I expected because like when Apple, at first I thought I would do it in Swift, but turns out when they released Swift at that point, all the graphics code were coming into out because Apple was always a little step behind in the graphics stuff. So they couldn't do it. So my son, who was a programmer already in college, I'd probably say, dad, you should do it as a web app. So he wrote a, a library for me that's let me write a web kit uh, pipeline for doing this project. So the whole AR project was actually done as a web 
app uh, using WebKit on the iPad. And this order of 2015, people thought I was crazy trying that. It worked out really well. And I'm a big fan of how the web works and all that. So this whole project was done as a, in HTML and JavaScript. The nice thing is because you're working in an environment where things are very dynamic, things can all change in real time, it was such a blast to work on because now you can change things in real time and do a lot of really cool stuff and try it out and break it and it'll still work, right? And it was a really great learning experience for me to go gone through and design this and actually end up writing most of the code for it and probably most of the animation for it as well, except for the Pixar stuff. The Pixar guy did that. But it was an uh, eye-opener for me at this point to realize the world has changed, right? The web have changed how we think about people interacting together. Because in, during this project, my whole team were online on the web, modifying things together in real time. It was, it was really amazing. So, okay. There's a video of the project. I won't get into it. And uh, my time is running out very quickly. So I will skip that. Then I spent a few years after that, I moved to the other area, I moved to the medical area. And I was helping company building pipeline for VR for medical. Well, it turns out in this case, this is actually a good example. But the bottleneck in the pipeline is not the technology, but at the end, they couldn't keep the VR goggles clean. So for senior using VR, that was a big issue because you spread germs and disease between users. It has nothing to do with the technology, but with the, the process of using it. And I went, went on to move and help the team do a real-time pipeline, the ultrasound to the web from a portable ultrasound device. And that was fun. And I, I was testing all these new ground, let's put it this way. And I advised a bunch of people doing AR stuff and uh, recently helping a good friend of mine, Adam Chin, do using machine learning to do um, artwork. So I'll jump to that, that's it. But the main thing, I just want to wrap up very quickly because my time's running out, is that given all that, I can tell you there's still so much more to do, right? First thing is very important is, besides all the challenges I listed during my talk, you got to have a team that you support and willing to make a lot of mistakes. Right? I used to tell people when I give talks to students, they always ask me, what's your secret? I say, my secret is I can I make mistakes faster than any of you. Well, now I can say I made more mistakes than anybody. But it's important that you have a team that support each other. So you allow each other to make mistakes, try things out. If it doesn't work, you help overcome it. And break the barriers down between departments, right? Because all this stuff is new every day. You think you know it all in a certain department, you don't. If you're doing pipeline, you're doing development, spend time in production. Learning that is very important. Feel the pain. Because I always I used to put our R&D guy into software guy into production to force them to fail the pain. I say, if you're gonna write software, write something that people can use, okay? And you can use it. Don't just imagine people using it. You have to use it yourself. So, I mean, I can talk forever on this stuff. I know my time is up. So, here we go. <laughs> I will bring the screen back. Richard, thank you very much. That was an amazing, amazing talk. Thank you. Um, everybody, the next talk is the virtual production. So if you head back to Whova, you'll get the link there for the next talk. Richard, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.